Welcome to Pile Buck's Marine Construction Series. In this series, we're going to cover just about every marine construction topic you can think of, including dredging, breakwaters, jetties, seawalls, bulkheads, shore protection, weight handling equipment, and this is just the beginning. So stay tuned. For the first video, we're going to educate you on harbor construction and the basics of planning, including permits, wave protection, depth requirements, design considerations, and more. We hope you like what you see. Before we begin, we'd like to thank our sponsor and good friends at Jet Filter System. Want to prevent retaining and seawall failure? Check out JetFilterSystem.com to learn how their maintainable weep hole filters provide drainage and soil filtration for concrete seawalls, sheet piling, bridge abutments, bulkheads, and much more. Now back to the video. Planning for harbor construction begins with the selection of a site. The design engineer must consider several factors including harbor use objectives, economics, and in some military prescribed cases, the expediency of construction. The process of site selection consists of comparing alternative sites and progressively eliminating the less desirable alternatives. Final selection requires the preparation of preliminary layouts and comparative cost and resource estimates. Permits. All works located in the waters of the United States and its territories are under the jurisdiction of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. This zone is generally located seaward from the mean high water line. A core permit is required for all dredging, filling, construction, or maintenance works. However, at a local level, they cannot override the permit objections of the Department of the Interior, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Department of Commerce, Bureau of Commercial Fisheries. Principal Factors in Harbor Siting There's a great deal to consider when selecting a site for harbor construction, including access. Vessel access to the harbor site must contain adequate depths and clearance for safe navigability. Land access to the harbor site is, or can be reasonably developed, to provide required land transportation linkage. Size and depth. There must be protected water depth and space adequate to accommodate intended vessel traffic in entrance and turning basins, mooring areas, and berthing areas. Land areas of sufficient size and elevation are required to accommodate support needs. They must be free from flooding or inundation. Potential for future enlargement or change in harbor use should be considered. Currents. Current velocity should be minimum and except for localized areas and or special considerations should not exceed four knots. Fouling rate. A desirable factor is a low fouling rate and relative freedom from marine borers, hydroids, and other biofouling organisms which can be drawn into the cooling systems of ships. Water circulation. Water basins should have sufficient natural circulation. Sedimentation. The effect of the harbor site on natural regimes of the coastal and riverine sediment transport and supply must be thoroughly evaluated. It's desirable not to interfere with the natural regime of sediment movements. The effects of harbor development on the sediment system may require maintenance dredging and or shore stabilization. Meteorological. Storm. Avoid locations to the direct effects of pronounced, severe, and frequent storms. Fog. Consider local variations in fog intensity and avoid the more severe sites where practical. Ice. Avoid locations which might be ice locked for several months a year. Economics. Economic considerations must be weighed against depth requirements. In harbors where tidal range is very large and particularly where an entrance channel is long, consider the possibility of restricting the entrance of the largest draft ships. Where hard bottoms prevail and excavation costs are high, consider the exclusion of certain classes of deep draft vessels with provision of lighter service between deep water anchorage and docks. Wave protection. The harbor configuration should provide adequate wave shelter in the form of interior basins 
for mooring and berthing of ships. Limiting values of wave heights in interior basins should include consideration of vessel to wavelength ratios. For large naval vessels and non-resonant storm wave conditions, a preliminary design criteria using a four-foot limiting wave height may be applied. In cases of small craft, the limiting wave height should be two feet. Depth requirements. Generally, harbor area depths vary. Certain areas are set aside for the use of small craft and other areas for the use of larger ships. Depth requirements for channels differ from those at anchorages and berths. No matter which area is under consideration, provision of adequate depth at all anticipated water levels is essential. Anchorage and berthing areas. For a specific vessel, the depth requirements at anchorage and berthing areas are identical. Channels. For fully operational channels protected from direct storm wave attack, the desirable ratio of channel depth to navigational draft of the largest vessel should be 1.3. This applies to vessel speeds of less than seven knots. For vessel speeds in excess of seven to eight knots, the ratio should be 1.5. Detailed depth design. The depth of the channel is determined by adding the estimated maximum vessel draft and bottom clearance relative to the sea surface level in the absence of wind waves. This is known as the still water level or SWL. The maximum vessel draft is based on several factors. These include static draft. The extreme draft of a vessel at rest in still water equals the distance from the water surface to its lowest underwater extremity. The value for the maximum loaded draft of an undamaged vessel must be adjusted to account for list, trim, and water density changes. Wave motion. Where a vessel is in a water area subject to wave action, vertical motions will increase the extreme draft relative to the still water level. Rotational motions of pitch and roll, as well as vertical displacement through heaving motion, will occur. Vessel draft. The factors that affect maximum vessel draft include squat. When a vessel is underway in shallow water or in a restricted channel, the water surface near the quarter point of the vessel drops below the normal level and the vessel tends to settle or squat in the depression. The amount of squat depends on the speed of the vessel through the water, the distance between the keel and the bottom, the trim of the vessel, the cross-sectional area of the channel, the presence of other vessels in the channel passing or overtaking the subject vessel, and the location of the vessel relative to the channel centerline. The amount of squat will increase when vessels travel near one side of the channel. Squat will also be increased if there are two or more vessels passing one another side by side. Why do retaining walls fail? Well, here's a quick tip from Jet Filter System. The vast majority of retaining structure failures occur due to the buildup of excessive hydrostatic water pressure caused by either a lack of adequate drainage or impermeability of the backfill materials. With the Jet Filter System installed, water pressure can be released without taking the valuable soil from behind the wall, causing erosion or sinkholes. Give the wall a chance to maximize its lifespan. Bottom clearance allowance. Other factors to consider in determining the clearance between the maximum vessel draft and the bottom are vessel operation, type of bottom material, and a factor of safety. Water levels. Water levels fluctuate. Both daily and extreme water level changes must be taken into account. This includes storm surges and tsunamis. However, other phenomena that affect water levels include astronomical tides. These are the periodic forces on large bodies of water resulting from motion and mass attractions of the earth, moon, and sun. River discharge. This is where a harbor site is hydraulically influenced by river discharge. Present as well as a future river flood discharge can affect water levels. Extreme water levels. A combination of events may produce extreme water level conditions that negatively impact the operation or safety of the harbor. The probability of their occurrence should be estimated. Now before we continue, be sure to crush the like button and subscribe to receive more marine construction guides. We appreciate your support.
other design considerations. Other design considerations include channel bends, depth, and turning basins. Channel bends. The path of a ship in a channel bend is wider than it is in straight sections. If channel bends are unavoidable, the channel should be widened. Depth. Except where heavy silting conditions require greater depth at individual berths at low water, the depth should equal to the maximum navigational draft of the largest vessel to be accommodated plus 10%. Turning basins. Where space is available, provide turning basins to minimize the use of tugs. As a rule of thumb, consider that a vessel can be turned comfortably in a radius of twice the length of the vessel or where ease of maneuver is not important in a radius equal to the vessel length. For shorter turning radii, the vessel must be assisted by tugs. Use the following best practices when incorporating basins. Locate one turning basin at the head of navigation. Locate a second just inside the breakwater. Where heavy traffic is anticipated, provide intermediate basins to reduce congestion and save time. Where feasible, use an area of the harbor that has required size and depth in its natural state. A turning basin is frequently desirable at the entrance to dry docks. They are also useful at the interior or landward end of long piers or wharves, providing multiple length berthing. Shipyards. Harbors or sections of harbors designed as shipyards require special facilities and designs. The design engineer must consider and plan for waterways, piers, dry docks, ancillary facilities, and land needs. Waterways. The shipyard portion of the harbor requires a channel sufficiently large to accommodate the largest vessel to be served by the shipyard. Piers. Special considerations for repair and outfitting piers includes crane rails for portal cranes, railroad tracks between crane rails, and special service piping to shipside galleries or service boxes. Dry docks. Dry docks are of two basic types, floating and graving. Floating dry docks may be moved from place to place and are suitable for servicing smaller ships and submarines. A graving dry dock is permanently placed and facility dug into the embankment. Such dry docks are usually equipped with portal cranes that travel around the perimeter of the dock and they're surrounded by service and lay down areas for large ship parts and equipment. Ancillary facilities. Additional facilities and water area should be allocated for anchorage or moorage of ships awaiting repair service as well as for tugboats and fireboats. Land needs. Land area should be allocated to shipyard use in sufficient quantity to provide for rail or highway access including on-site storage of vehicles and goods required for shipyard operations. Aids to navigation. The harbor may need to provide aids to navigation. This might include lighthouses, range lights, directional lights, minor lights, lighted and unlighted buoys, day beacons, and fog signals. Other types of aids to navigation include light ships, radio beacons, radar beacons, and Loran stations. Once again, we want to thank our sponsor, Jet Filter System. Check them out at jetfiltersystem.com or call 800-475-2029 to save money and prevent retaining and seawall failure. Well, that's all we have for now and be sure and subscribe so you'll be notified whenever we release a new video guide.